I find this work menacing, yet playful because of the way the Egyptian motifs highlight a more metaphorical resonance. As an advocate of the 64-bit aesthetic, I worry that the sexy fish dynamic threatens to undermine the themes of a more traditional buildings roman. Oh, this. This is just trash. Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, over-interpreting art since 2011. Loyal theorists, do you realize that we're living in an amazing time? We are literally standing at the precipice of history. Right now, things are changing. New movements are happening and old regimes are crumbling around us. Oh, wait, did you think I was talking about politics? Or the fact that we're curing diseases and sending people to Mars, blah blah blah? Screw that noise! I am talking about the indie gaming revolution. <laughs> Yo quiero Taco Bell! Viva la revolucion! You see, gaming right now is in a bit of a weird place. With the exception of some really well-received titles this year, AAA gaming has been struggling a lot. Watch underscore Dogs 2 dropped 80% in sales compared to the original, Dishonored 2 and the latest Titanfall 2 also saw plummeting sales, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. GameStop is very quickly dying, huge names in the industry like Hideo Kojima, David Jaffe, and Cliff Blazinski have gone independent, while those who've had indie success plan to stay in that scene rather than moving up to the AAA development teams. The bigger, quote-unquote, better, more beautiful AAA games have started to feel more like cash grabs. Between DLC, pre-orders, microtransactions, all of which are resulting in players just getting more disillusioned. And pile all of that onto the fact that new systems now promise top-of-the-line graphics, but graphics are already so good that nothing seems revolutionary, and you've got yourself a bit of a pickle. A pickle Rick! Sorry, only those with the highest of IQs will be able to appreciate the subtlety of that pop culture reference. Enter Indie Gaming. Although indie games have been around since the earliest days of gaming, between 2006 and 2008 as internet became faster and more accessible, and with Steam making access to these sorts of games easier, indie development started to skyrocket. Early hits like Braid and Super Meat Boy wore their influences on their sleeve. They were all ripping on well-established gaming formats, unforgiving old-school platformers, roguelikes, metroidvanias, but the indie scene has evolved a lot since those early days. In the last 10 years, you've really started to see things go over the top, where the references to old established formats have gotten more and more abstract, and the idea of what even makes a game starting to feel pretty darn loose. You have the birth of entirely new genres of games, like Rage Games, Surgeon Simulator, I Am Bread, commentaries on low-effort simulator games with controls that intentionally make the game difficult to play. My new favorite, Doki Doki Literature Club, a game that looks like a visual novel dating sim on the outside, but ends up being a psychological horror game on the inside, intentionally showing how shallow and plastic dating sim formats are. And when you start to get really abstract, you get Cow Clicker, where you click on a cow and watch random numbers go up as a commentary on mindless, addictive mobile games. So why has this massive industry-wide shift happened? And more importantly, once games go meta, where do you go from there? Well, it turns out we're now at a point where we can predict the future in gaming because all of this has happened before. In fact, it all happened decades before. Because when you look at these trends in gaming, they're actually following the exact same pattern as modern art history. No joke, in just over 30 years, gaming has gone through the exact same trends that took the rest of art 150 years to get around to. So get ready to show this episode to your history teacher, your English teacher, and your grandma who keeps telling you that the Minecrafts are rotting your brain because you're about to show them all how Miyamoto beasted Picasso. And get ready to impress all your friends too because you know what's going to be the next big trend in the gaming scene that's gonna roll around in about the next five to ten years or so. In order to understand how history is repeating itself, we first have to know that history. And I'm talking art history specifically. Art, like most things in life, tends to happen in phases. It's like clothing fads where for a while bell bottoms are in, then skinny jeans happened, and somehow I'm still left wearing Uggs, even though it's not 2005 anymore. But damn it, are my feet warm and snuggly. Unlike clothes, though, art trends move slowly. Like hundreds of years at a time 
slowly. And although there have been a bunch of smaller art movements over the years, the ones I'm focusing on today are macro trends in the art scene. And the first one that I care about today for this theory is modernism, which started in the late 1800s and went all the way through the end of World War II in 1945. And just to avoid me getting any abstract expressionist death threats in my mailbox from triggered art majors, let me just say that these dates tend to be a bit flexible, and these definitions I'm using today are obviously a bit more simplified than what you would be having in your college courses. So what does modernism mean? Well, it boils down to the idea that we should all, in the words of classic modernist Ezra Pound, make it new. By inventing new painting styles to paint, new books to write, and new poetry to poet, modernism is all about going beyond the way things were done before, and coming up with better ways of doing those things. The earliest modernists were people like Ekans. Chabaka! Actually, we can't use a Pokemon reference there because his name is pronounced Thomas Akins. Thomas Akins, who created realistic paintings that showed life the way it really was. So instead of painting a healer magically curing someone like old painters used to do, he literally painted surgery as it was happening. This was something that no one had ever seen before in the form of a painting. Then you have Constantin Brancouche, who's often regarded as the most important sculptor of the 20th century. Unlike the true-to-life sculptures that dominated art up to that point, Constantin's work was simple, with subjects reduced to pure forms aimed at revealing the true essence of the subjects underneath. Compare the very traditional sculpture, The Kiss, by Rodin to Constantin's modernist approach, The Kiss. Then came the Impressionists like Renoir, who were inspired by the fact that people don't really see each other, but rather see the light reflected off of each other. Based on that, he created these ethereal pieces that looked a bit blurry, but were supposed to look like our most vibrant and evocative personal memories. Again, something people hadn't seen before. New color palettes, new subjects, matters, new brush styles, and this is what modernism is all about, taking techniques and ideas from previous generations and improving on them, innovating them, using them in new ways to tell bigger and better, more expressive and more authentic, true-to-life stories. So, you see any parallels to gaming? Gaming has improved dramatically since it started in earnest in the 80s, and as the capacity for technology has increased from a couple of dots on a screen to 8, 16, 32 bits and beyond, video game developers have taken advantage of every new pixel and shader to create bigger, better, more expressive video games. What has always been the buzzword of gaming? No, not microtransactions. No, not open world. No, not immersion. Oh yeah, actually it is immersion. Yes, totally. M immersion. And as the artistic palette available to game makers expanded, it was used to create more in-depth, more immersive, and more emotional games. While modern art like Renoir's masterpieces wanted to make us feel like we were literally living out our most vivid memories, video games have worked for years to build whole worlds that'll immerse us in more detailed fantasy than we can imagine. It was revolutionary to see Mario in 3D, or to watch Yuna's cutscene from Final Fantasy X, or to experience the physics of Portal. These moments were better than anything that came before them. And more recently, think of Skyrim and Breath of the Wild. They're just as impressive to us today as people seeing those modernist masterpieces a hundred years ago, because in both cases, bigger stories are being told with new and improved techniques. Modernism. But with so much progress, and games being so beautiful and massive and textures feeling more and more real, where do you go now? Call of Duty can only get more real if it gives you actual PTSD. New systems now promise top-of-the-line graphics, but graphics are already so good that I can see individual arm hairs on my NFL player. So where do we go to next? Well, it turns out that the art movement had the same problem like 70 years ago. In the 1940s, art entered the post-modernism phase, and it's here where we start to see why the indie revolution is such a huge trend in gaming right now. Don't think your favorite indie gem is part of an art movement that started two generations ago? Well, <laughs> think again. Postmodernism basically takes all that progress and go get em attitude and innovation from modernism and says, nah, I'm cool, bro. Basically, it's defined as a rejection of modernism, which is a bit hard to grasp. So think about it this way. Modernism defined new kinds of art and moves all those art techniques forward. Postmodernism says that literally anything can be art because all art is subjective. It gets into some weird territory because this is how you have things like urinals and bowling pins mounted on the walls of museums. Is it art? Is it not art? Well, postmodernism says, maybe, if you want it to be. So how the heck does a basketball in a display case at the Tate Museum of London apply to gaming? Well, one of the big things that postmodernism does is riff on all the modernist art that came before it. If cubism is modern art, then in postmodern art, someone might just literally paint a cube and say it's commenting on the cubist art style. My favorite painting of the style, which actually came a bit before the trend 
trend caught on is by surrealist René Magritte called The Treachery of Images. It's a painting of a pipe with the words, this is not a pipe, written under it. You get it? Because it's a pipe, but in reality, it's a painting. So which is it, pipe or painting? Well, it's both and neither. Is it art? Well, it doesn't matter. In postmodernism, art knows that it's art and it makes fun of itself. It undermines itself. It destroys itself. And that's the whole point. In indie gaming, you're starting to see the exact same idea come through in those experimental titles that shake up your whole idea of what a game should even be. Try Soda Drinker Pro, an acid trip of mashed up environments and crappy controls that literally pretends to be a terrible game until you unearth its completely hidden and much more polished underside. Or how about games like Mountain, which promise to let you, quote, fulfill your dreams of becoming a mountain, end quote. Or Rock Simulator, a joke that got itself crowdfunded and whose gameplay consists entirely of observing a rock. Do you guys just have too much money and want to throw it away? Because if so, I, I will gladly take that money off your hands. It, it is fine. And most obviously of all, this shift reflects the huge movement towards games that know their games. From Pony Island, where you have to break out of your own game file, to Undertale, where saving and reloading are essential parts of the experience to, again, Doki Doki Literature Club that has you literally manipulating the game's files to affect the horrific outcomes that you see on screen. These are games that are committed to breaking the rules of how to play, what to play, and what the idea of playing even means. So we're currently in this super meta phase of gaming which begs the question of where can you possibly go next? Once you've torn down and dissected all the old genres of gaming, once you've made fun of the gamer for being a terrible person and killing everyone, if you spent the last decade of our tearing apart everything that came before, what remains? Well, looking at the art world, what comes after postmodernism is post-postmodernism. Wait, really? That's that's the best you guys got? I thought you were supposed to be creative artists. Anyway, post-postmodernism is still pretty vague because it literally just started in 1990, and we've already discussed how art movements take a while to rev up, but basically it's the idea that we're eventually gonna get tired of all the irony and self-awareness and meta-ness of postmodernism and go back to appreciating things unironically. Or, in other words, all this stuff that we see as crazy and revolutionary now will just become the new normal, and we'll re-examine how games should relate to reality again. Tell actual stories, actual narratives that are compelling in and of themselves, and not rely on some meta surprises along the way. But heck, by then we'll all be living in virtual and augmented reality worlds reminiscent of Ready Player One that we create ourselves anyway, so yeah, all of this will probably be a moot point. But anyway, while we wait for it to happen, go watch my playthrough of Doki Doki Literature Club on GT Live, cause that game is too good, and needs way more attention than it currently has. Links are in that eye icon in the upper right hand corner. It's also free, so you should go and play yourself. It's, it's an amazing experience. And remember, whether you like that game or not, whether you like any game or not, don't be too hard on it. You might see it in a museum next to the Mona Lisa someday. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.